Yeah, I appreciate it. I was, I, I'm don't know if Jason told you that we're we're old friends, right? So I feel like he has he witnessed a lot of those uh, big pivots and changes that I made in my life, and yeah. probably thought I was crazy. But um, I appreciate you reaching out. Um, yeah, having me on. we all have to be a little bit crazy, right, to get to where we're, we <laughs> we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our favorite part of the week. It's time to listen to Sounds of Health, where we share the stories, people, and resources that help others to improve their physical, emotional, and financial well-being. I'm your host, Dave McNiven, and today I'm excited to welcome our guest, Amanda Guarnier. Amanda is a nurse practitioner and entrepreneur. She's the founder of Resume Rx, an online career platform for nursing professionals and the director of growth for Collaborating Docs. If you are a longtime listener to the podcast, Collaborating Docs may sound familiar to you. We did have a guest on um, from that organization, and we're really excited to have Amanda here to talk about her story and what got her into this business and, uh, and her path to being an entrepreneur and nurse practitioner. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Happy to be here. So you are joining us over Zoom. Um, we're playing around with our setup and our format a little bit. Uh, so this is really exciting uh, to kind of adapt to it. But we're really excited to have you here. Now, where are you calling in from? So I'm actually down the road in Reading, Connecticut. Okay. So not too far. Great. Not too far. Awesome. So we usually start with an icebreaker question, which is just what makes you happiest these days? Ooh. Um, so these days, I would say sitting on my back porch at around 6 p.m. The sun is getting ready to set. There are birds that I'm identifying in my backyard. There's a light breeze, you know, enjoying a fresh beverage with my husband. That's that's the life is good moment these days, especially during the summer. That sounds like a great day. So are you a bird watcher? Uh, not, not really, not until lately when we had this bird in our backyard who we recognized kept coming back to the same spot and singing the same song. So we got this <laughs> app that we downloaded so that we could identify what this bird was. And so I guess this is the start of our, my, uh, amateur bird watching days. That's awesome. It's <laughs> addicting. I think a lot of people I that I know so. start to get into it. Um, my mother put up a bird feeder outside her kitchen window and loved it so much that suddenly now she has one of those bird feeders that is through the window. So the bird's actually like inside the house in this oh. little enclosure. It's pretty interesting. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of fun. So that's awesome. I, I think um, that's a great way to just kind of get to know you and, uh, and see, you know, what makes you happiest and things like that. Um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and what brought you to what you're doing today? Sure. So um, kind of to start where I am today, I'm a nurse practitioner um, by training, and I work in kind of an unconventional setting for a nurse practitioner. Um, but to kind of take you back to my uh, nurse practitioner origin story, if you will, I actually did my undergraduate studies in a non-healthcare related field. I went to UConn for my undergrad, and I was studying music education. Um, I'm a violinist, and I also studied Italian language. So I completed my degrees in those two fields. And while I was studying, and actually while I was studying abroad in Italy during my junior year, I had a bit of an existential crisis of, you know, what am I doing with my life? Where is my career path going? <laughs> what really makes me happy. Um, and it was in that moment that I decided that I was going to completely pivot and, you know, finish up the studies that I had started, but pursue um, a degree in the medical field. And fortunately, there were many programs for me to choose from that were geared towards people like me who kind of had this realization after the traditional point. And, and so I applied to, they're called second degree nurse practitioner programs. So geared towards people who have bachelor's degrees in other fields. And um, the programs 
are a bit accelerated where you, you know, finish a bachelor's in nursing and then go right into a nurse practitioner program. So that's, um, that's what I did. I ended up getting into Yale School of Nursing, moved to New Haven, <clears throat> and spent three years in, in the trenches of, <laughs> of uh, learning everything there was to learn about nursing and advanced practice nursing. Um, and, and really what kind of inspired me to go down that path was, was thinking about what I enjoyed learning about, how I enjoyed helping people. Um, and, you know, I was really, really passionate about being able to contribute to kind of positive change in when it came to health and wellness, um, for people. So that is what kind of got me into the nurse practitioner profession. Um, and I graduated uh, 13 years ago now, and I've had a variety of different clinical jobs in my career and also some non-traditional roles, uh, including starting my own business, um, starting my own medical practice, and now working in um, more marketing and sales role for collaborating docs. That's amazing. It seems like a pretty big shift to go from being a violinist and studying Italian to then becoming a nurse <laughs> practitioner. But I can kind of see the through line there um, and, and why maybe you, you did that. W where did you study abroad in Italy? I studied in a small town called Ascoli Piceno. And the program, UConn and University of New Hampshire had a joint program and they basically had a remote campus there, but uh, it was very much um, an immersion type town. There were not a lot of English speakers, not a lot of tourists. It was on the Adriatic coast, just a beautiful small town there. Um, and it was, it was such a wonderful experience and afforded me this opportunity to really be out of my day to day and examine you know, my, my life as a whole yeah. and, and have a lot of interesting and important realizations. Were you playing music while you were there? I was, yes. I, it was mainly to study Italian for the Italian part of my, right. my degree, but I did a retain a private violin instructor, um, who I took lessons with on a weekly basis, who spoke not a lick of English and, <laughs> you know, my Italian was, was good. Right. But, yeah. um, there's a difference between conversational Italian and uh, the instruction of music Italian. So oh, I'm <laughs> it was sure. a, bit of a, yeah. a bit of a learning curve there, but it was fun. Yeah, I had a similar experience. I studied abroad in Italy as well uh, in a little town called Urbino through the Southern mm. Connecticut State University. And when I was doing that, I was an, an actor and a writer and I did a lot of drawing. So being over there and kind of being immersed in all of this culture and art was just such an incredible experience. Um, so I can, I can see, uh, kind of what that was for you as well. Um, and, and of course I, I didn't really know Italian either. I, I kind of got by while I was over there. I, I feel like I understood a whole lot more than I could speak. Um, but, uh, it, what a great experience and what a great country to, to have that time in. Yes, it was, it was really lovely. And I had started, my dad's born in Italy and I had started studying in high school. Um, so I've, always been interested in Italian culture because it was part of my identity and of course studying the language and my big victory at the end of my study abroad semester I was taking a taxi to the airport um, and I was chatting with the taxi driver and he was asking where I was going and I told him that I was going home and and he said what do you mean where what do you mean you're going home and I said I'm going home to the United States and he said what what do you mean you're not Italian so I had um I had perfected my language so much so that um, I fooled a taxi driver That's into thinking fantastic. I was native. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So that's, that brings us kind of to what you're doing now then, right? So you, you got started as a nurse practitioner. Tell me how you got started in the field and, and then how you got to where you are now. So my first job was working in a student health center. Um, you know, I was a younger graduate of an NP program. I think I was 25 or 26 when I graduated. Uh, and I really had a strong passion for helping adolescents. I really enjoyed reproductive health. So getting a job at a university student health center uh, was a great first job for me. I stayed there for about a year. Um, and then I moved into uh, more of a hospital-based specialty position. Um, 
and I was working uh, in the emergency department. So it made a pretty big, pretty big pivot to sure emergency medicine, yeah. um, which I ended up loving. And, and that's really where the majority of my clinical experience has been for many years. Um, not only was it the type of specialty where I was learning something new all the time, but I, I definitely find that my brain needs to be kind of constantly stimulated with new things in order for me not to get get bored, frankly. Yeah. So emergency department was, was really great for that. And then, you know, once I started, um, so once I started my family, um, it helped as well. So I had twins back in 2016. And, um, even though it was, uh, terrible for me, I ended up working straight nights because it just made life so much easier in terms of childcare and having a predictable schedule. Um, so I worked straight nights in the emergency department for, for several years. So you couldn't um, have been getting a lot of sleep during that time. <clears throat> um, not as much as I should have been. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was uh, a sacrifice that I, that I made, um, yeah. that, uh, I will never work nights again. <laughs> gotcha. I'm too old for okay. that now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so worked in emergency medicine for many years and then, um, I had my third child in the summer of 2019, and we had just moved to New Jersey. And uh, I took some time off after, you know, after having my daughter. I said, you know, we had just moved to a new area. I said, I'm going to take my time finding a job. So she was born in August of 2019. Um, I gave myself a good three, four months to, you know, just uh, enjoy that. And towards the end of 2019, I started applying for jobs. And we were living right outside of New York City in Alpine, New Jersey. And uh, I ended up um, in December or January signing a contract to start a per diem job at a New York City ER. And um, something about you know, healthcare in general, when you sign up for, when you sign on to a job, there's a credentialing process that can take a while. They need to verify that you are who you say you sure, are, of course. They get you on the panels of all the insurances. Um, and it takes months, right? So I signed the contract in January, 2020. Maybe you can see where this is going, but um, they called me the first week of April, 2020 saying your credentialing is done. Can you start tomorrow? And uh, if you remember what um, was <laughs> what going on in New York like? City, right. <laughs> in yeah. New York City in particular, um, the first week of April 2020, it was where's the PPE, you know, a, a huge peak madness. of COVID complete cases. Madness. It was complete madness. Yeah. Um, and by that time, my, you know, my twins were were three. Their school had shut down. Um, I couldn't have a babysitter in my house anymore. It was just, it was chaos. Um, so unfortunately I let that job go. And that was a big pivotal moment because I hadn't expected to take really any time away from clinical practice other than the time, you know, the maternity leave time. Right. So, um, it was a hard decision. I, I grappled, uh, internally with a lot of emotions of, you know, whether I was letting my colleagues down by not, you know, being on the front line of this pandemic. But the reality was I had a newborn. Um, I had young children at home. There was no way that I could guarantee my safety or their safety. Course, so I made yeah. the tough decision not to work clinically during that time um, and made, uh, you know, another another pivot. I had already started my, um, my business, my Resume Rx business on the side uh, and decided all right, if I'm not going to work clinically, then I'll make this my main focus. And so for the next two years or so, I really went kind of all in on building that company um, to be, you know, of service to nurses and nurse practitioners in their in their professional landscape during that time. So yeah. um, the majority of the content and the services provided were helping them get better jobs, helping them negotiate helping them interview well, just kind of navigate that professional landscape in a way that, you know, helped them um, kind of get what they needed to get out of their professional journey. So that's something you had started on the side before everything else happened with COVID and the pandemic. Right. And yes. what, what made you kind of go in that direction? What, what gave you that idea? I had, um, I had gone part-time at my job um, after the twins were born and was just looking for really more of a creative outlet. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but ideally a creative outlet that also generated some money to help 
pay for my student loans. Um, so I started writing resumes for other people. And I actually got this idea in a Facebook group that I was in where someone had asked for advice about um, how to write their resume or or it, could someone review it? And, and I realized that this was a skill that I had that a lot of people didn't. Um, it's something that came very easily to me. So uh, I started by writing some resumes in exchange for testimonials. And before long, um, you know, word of mouth took over and I was getting inbound inquiries about my services. Mm. And I knew that writing resumes for other people was going to take, you know, the more I did, the more time it would take. Right. So I was thinking forward of how can I make this a bit more leveraged in terms of my time. So what I did was I turned, I was making some nice template designs. And what I did was I templatized six different resume designs and bundled them in a package with some prompts and, you know, some videos about how to do it yourself. Um, and ultimately created that as a digital product that I sold on my website. So eventually I was able to stop actually writing the resumes for people and instead direct them to this one product that I had made that was much lower cost, that um, that was more accessible so that people could learn how to do it on their own and, and have that, that skill set moving forward. That's so that's, really that's how it still exists today. Um, I, I don't spend a ton of time on it anymore, which is, which is really nice. Um, but, you know, the website and the platform um, exists and um, kind of runs runs on its own to some extent. That's amazing. Is it specific to people in the healthcare field? Yes. It is. Okay. It is specific for nurses. Uh, nursing professionals is really the, the umbrella target there. And you knew enough when you started to do that, that you maybe saw the the opportunity to make it into a business because it sounds like for you to do that, you were collecting testimonials for a purpose, right? You kind of knew that this might be something you were going to go into. Yes. Yes. I, I had, I had long wondered how could I use my skills in another way? Um, so I had dabbled with, um, content writing. So I had, uh, written a few continuing ed courses for some continuing ed companies, which, you know, was something that, was some extra income, but honestly, I didn't enjoy it very much. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> I'd done some blog writing, some medical blog writing, and I was, you know, I've I've always enjoyed creative writing. That's kind of like my my right brain side from from liberal arts studies. Yeah, right. Um, so I was really looking for a way to kind of mesh mesh the two, and um, and so yeah, the the kind of idea hit me when I saw people asking about it. And once I saw that one post, it's kind of like the red car theory. I just kept seeing more posts of right. people asking for help in this area. And that's when I, you know, had the idea to, you know, turn it into a business, but also a platform with lots of free resources. So, you know, I've got hundreds of blog posts on my website. I used to have a podcast myself, you know, I produced 150 episodes of the podcast. So um, those are all resources that live on that are for free. And then, right. um, you know, for people who need a little extra support, you know, I've got something that they can purchase that's less than $40 that will help them. That's amazing. So that website still exists. How do people go find that? Yep. That's the resume rx.com. Okay. And we'll put that up in the information we have as well. So that's still there. What about the podcast that, that still exists out there? It's yep. It still uh, exists. I'm not producing any new episodes, okay. but all the existing episodes are available for consumption. And what is that called? That is called Nurse Becoming. Nurse Becoming. Okay, that's great. So it sounds like you. <laughs> it sounds like you found outlets for your creativity I with, sure within did. what yeah. you do and with this career <laughs> yes. that you've built for yourself. Um, yes. So I mean, I can see the entrepreneurial spirit for sure. Uh, and then now you're. What are the things you're doing? You're with Collaborating Docs. So tell me what your life looks like now professionally. Sure. So my full-time role is with Collaborating Docs. I am their director of growth, which means that I really oversee marketing um, and our referral and affiliate program and support our founder in, in our growth efforts. Um, I've been working for them for a little over a year, and I first started out leading their onboarding team. And just to kind of give a little bit of context, Collaborating Docs is a 
company that matches nurse practitioners and PAs with collaborating physicians in, in the states where it's required. So we work with a lot of entrepreneurial clinicians who are starting their own practice. So um, as you can imagine, I have a lot uh, of, of fun doing that and yeah, a lot to I offer bet. helping helping um, helping our clients. So for, on a day-to-day basis, you know, this is my full-time job. So I work from home. This We're a remote organization. So I work from home on, you know, different projects and initiatives on the growth side and also still meet with clients a, a little bit and take some onboarding calls uh, and also do some business consulting calls with our existing clients. So that is my um, my main focus and my full-time job there. Um, and then I have my own small boutique clinical practice on the side because I do want to maintain my clinical skills. Uh, I have to maintain clinical practice hours in order to maintain my certification. So that um, helps with those two things. So that's really you know, a half day per week that I'm, that I'm doing that. Um, and then I'm mom, <laughs> a mom of the, the three kiddos, right. and, uh, wife. Um, and I'm also <laughs> on, uh, the town's board of education. So those are the hats wow. that I wear. You're staying currently. busy for sure. Yes. So the, the boutique clinical practice describe that. What, what exactly are you offering? And do you have a, a location for that? So I'm currently uh, moving to a new location. So I'm currently only doing telehealth and home visit services as I wait for the construction to be done there. But the services that I provide are some aesthetic services. So facial injectables, skincare, Botox, that type of thing, and also um, medical weight loss programs. So um, particularly using kind of the the newer categories of, of meds that are showing not just weight loss benefits, but really longevity benefits and, and lots of chronic disease reduction. So gotcha. Um, okay. So you're working on those types of things for people kind of in collaboration with their physicians or are you kind of right. doing so it I'm not own? there. I'm not their primary care provider. Everyone right. needs to have their own primary care provider. Um, so it's, you know, mostly for folks whose primary care providers, you know, don't offer this type of of treatment or there's other ways that they're, you know, struggling to access these services. So I'm, you know, serving as more of a specialty, um, uh, provider in that regard. Gotcha. Okay. And now what brought you back to Connecticut from New Jersey? So my husband's job, he used to work in Manhattan and, um, we were in New Jersey because of that job. And actually we were being put up by the employer when we were in New Jersey. So when COVID hit, um, his organization had gone fully remote with the plans to come back maybe one or two days per week. So we were able to kind of do our, our house search and expand our radius of where we wanted to, where we wanted to buy a house. So we landed here in Reading, um, because it was commute distance to the city, um, and eventually he did end up having to go back in four days a week, which was quite rough from, <laughs> from bet. here. It was, yeah. you know, about a two hour, two hour commute. Um, but Connecticut was always where I wanted to land again. Um, my in-laws live here. I grew up in Rhode Island, so it's, you know, two, two and a half hours to family there. Great school system for the kids. Um, so, and I'm at the point now where I've lived, uh, away from Rhode Island longer than I ever lived there. Um, and many, many of those years, you know, especially undergrad, grad school and some time after and, and now, um, have been in Connecticut. So Connecticut feels like home to me. That's great. I I love Connecticut. I was born and raised here, spent some time in New York, but there's nothing like Connecticut. I agree. So you have a lot going on. (laughs) Obviously you're juggling quite (laughs) a bit between your family, uh, responsibilities and all of the things that you're doing professionally. What are the, some of the things that you do to keep yourself healthy? So I am really good about getting a good night's sleep every night. So that is one of my top priorities. Um, you know, I, I try not to really, once I put my kids to bed, I'm getting ready for bed and I have a very consistent kind of bedtime routine so that I can ensure that I have a good night's sleep every night. So I'm well rested. Um, I 
have um, a walking pad underneath my standing desk <laughs> so That's that I great. can multitask and uh, get my steps in while I'm on a meeting or or doing my other work because yeah my my life is is so full at this point that there's not a lot of extra time for extra things so I'm I'm doing a lot of multitasking um, so you know working from home. Uh, allows me to make good food choices. Um, so, you know, not eating out a lot. So, so in terms of, you know, staying healthy and happy, it's really prioritizing like good fuel, good sleep yeah. and, and movement and just kind of like keeping those basics. Um, and that seems to be enough. We, we hear anyway. everybody talking about how important sleep is these days. It seems to be in the ether now, like everybody's talking about how we need more sleep and more yes. rest. So that, yeah, that, we've heard that a lot. And I love the idea of the the standing desk with the walking pad. When COVID hit, I have a, a small office in North Haven. And one of the first things I did was I got a standing desk because I knew everything was going to be virtual at that point, And I didn't want to yeah. be sitting at my desk all the time. Um, but I love the walking pad. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it doesn't stay underneath the desk. I have to, you know, move it. Um, but yeah, I, I, in a, for a while there, I was, I had this one standing meeting every morning that was just like a talking meeting, um, which was, it's easy to walk and, and talk. It's not so easy to walk and type. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. but, but, uh, for a few weeks there, I was getting 10,000 steps before 10 AM and I was Fantastic. like, all right, that is a, that's a pretty, um, good accomplishment. So, so when I walk on my walking pad, that's usually my goal is, to challenge myself, how early in the day can I, you know, either close my ring on my watch or yeah. hit 10,000 steps? I love it. That's such a great idea. Just to kind of build it into your day of the things you're doing anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Habit right. stacking. Yeah. Making it easy. That's fantastic. So what are um, some of the th goals that you have? I mean, it, it sounds like you're doing so much and some of these things that you're doing kind of exist on their own. Um, do you have any things that you guys are trying to achieve with collaborating docs or maybe with your, your clinical practice, any things that you're working toward? Yeah, I would say, you know, with, with collaborating docs, we're trying to help as many um, NPs and PAs as possible. We've recently expanded our provider base. So we used to only work with nurse practitioners, but now we're open to all advanced practice nurses and PAs just to increase that access to help open as many practices as possible, basically, right? Because the trickle-down yeah. effect is, you know, when when we're helping a clinician, they're helping their community um, and increasing access to care. We have so many who are working in rural or underserved areas where they're the only practitioner, they're the only primary care provider in their town or in their county. And that's really impactful and, and, and meaningful to be a part of. So, um, you know, just helping as many as possible there. Um, and in terms of my own practice, I'm kind of good where where it is right now. I, I'm at the point where I'm I'm doing so much that really one of my goals is to do less um, and to kind of see, not necessarily, you know, give up major hats that I'm wearing, sure. but just kind of see where can I work smarter? Where can I delegate things to other people? what can I say no to? Um, because I'm, uh, if you haven't figured it out, I'm an over committer. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. So, yes. So it's more, um, you know, getting more comfortable saying no and recognizing my capacity because, uh, as much as I would love to, I can't do absolutely everything and do everything well. So, um, kind of figuring out how to get that balance and, and how to let go of, the, of some of the things that I don't need to be involved with. I think that's an important thing to realize for people, especially when you're trying to balance it all with family life and, you know, being there for your kids. Uh, there, mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of things that fill up your day. So I, I've, yes. I know that's something I've always struggled with is finding a way to say no when I need to and, uh, and focusing on the things that you know you're good at or that you want to develop. Are you, are you playing the violin anymore? You know, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> I'm sad to say, um, I did play in a community orchestra a few years ago. Um, that was really great. But honestly, once I once I got pregnant with the twins, 
um, it made that really difficult. Um, I do still take care of my instrument. I get, um, you know, I went just a little over a year ago to have him looked at by um, a violin uh, repair person just to make sure that, you know, he's in good shape and that he doesn't have any cracks. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's been a while. I, I'd like to, I'd like to say I will come back around to it at some point, but I also, that's another thing that like, I need to be okay with maybe it not happening. Right. And, um, I have a lot of guilt mainly for my mother, I think, hope she's not listening. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, you know, but it's, it's okay that that was a chapter of my life and it's okay that that chapter can be closed and, and coming to terms with that, I think is, uh, I don't need to hold on to any guilt if I, if I don't play again. So, Absolutely. As you can tell, that's something that I've worked through a little bit because <laughs> it sounds like it, you know, like just because there's a violin in the corner that's not being played, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean that, you know, I didn't have a really wonderful chapter of, of being a musician. Position, Absolutely, so. for sure. It's nice that you have that physical object too. That is a reminder of that time in your life, and it's always there if you ever do find the the craving or the need to go back to it. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's great. How's your Italian? <laughs> my Italian could be better. Um, you know, I try to keep up with my Duolingo on my phone just to, to keep oh, it fresh. Awesome. But I think what I need to do, I think I need a trip. I think I need to plan a I trip agree. so that I have yes. a really good excuse to, yes. to brush up. The only way to um, learn is to by Italian, immersing right? yourself. Yeah, exactly. So, but the big question is, are my, do I take my kids or not? So that's, yeah. You know, I, I don't know how you decide when kids are ready for a big international trip. Yeah. I think it depends on the type of trip you're taking. I have a lot of friends who have taken when they're really little, you know, overseas, especially to Italy, because you can, there are so many different types of trips you can do in other countries. You know, you can go and just experience a a family vacation. It just happens Mm -hmm. to be in Italy, you know? So, and, or you can do the whole touristy thing and go to all of the big cities. And then maybe that's when they're a little older, I don't know. I I always think about that too. My son is taking Italian now in high school and we hope to be able to get to Italy at some point as a family. Um, you know, while they still are able to hang with us before they get too crazy in their lives. Um, (laughs) I haven't been back since I studied there and, and I have a big Italian family too on my mother's side. And, uh, that's just, it's such an amazing place, but I can't speak a lick of Italian any longer. (laughs) So I, that's my excuse too. I'm like, I need to be immersed. That's the only way I'm going to learn. Yep. No, oh, I think that's good. My first trip was when was the summer after tenth grade in high school. That was when we went for a family as uh, went as a family for the first time. That's awesome. Um, so I'm I'm glad I had the experience to go in high school. I think it was really really formative then. I bet that's amazing. Well, hopefully you get back there at some point. Yeah. Thanks. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been such a great conversation. I know you have a busy day ahead of you and you need to get off to all of the different things that you're doing, but I appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning and to tell us about what you're doing. We'll definitely be sure to point people in the direction of all of these various things. Um, Can you just give me one little more nugget about the the resume service and when people should be looking for that and, and how to find that again? Yes, absolutely. So my website is theresumerx.com. And really, uh, it's geared towards nurses and nurses, nurse practitioners who need some advice in any of the career related topics. So when you land on the website, you'll see options to learn about how to write a resume, you'll see an option to purchase the resume template bundle that I have, uh, and then countless articles and um, blog posts and podcast episodes, just about navigating interviews, negotiating salary, what to expect uh, during a job orientation, those types of things. So if you are getting ready to graduate from school, nursing school or NP school, or you're in a season where you're considering applying for another job, then that's a great opportunity to land on my site and hopefully get some good advice. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you again for being here today and giving us your time. If you're out there listening to this podcast and you're here for Amanda, please go back and listen to some of our prior episodes. We've had some amazing guests, including one of your colleagues from Collaborating Docs. So we talk much more in depth about that organization on that episode. Um, So please, you know, like, share, subscribe. And Amanda, thank you again for being here. 
I wish you all the best in all of the things that you're doing and hopefully we'll have you back on someday. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. All right. You have a great day. You too. Sounds of Health is brought to you by Nutmeg Insurance Advisors and recorded at the offices of Nutmeg Advisory Group. The podcast is produced by Jason Carubia and Dave McNiven with music by Rob Haynes. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, X, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Your support means a lot to us, and we appreciate it when you like, subscribe, and leave a review. If you know someone who you think should be a guest on the show, please email us at soundsofhealthpodcast at gmail.com. Each week, we help you move the needle toward better health by spotlighting the stories, people, and resources that inspire and motivate others. And we are just getting started. Help us share these sounds and don't keep us a secret. Thank you.